If you will turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 1 as we continue our study through the Word. Now, we mentioned before that 2 Kings is just a continuation of 1 Kings. And, uh, and so we've been watching as the various kings have been put into power and we've been watching how the unrighteous kings have wreaked havoc on the nation. We saw that Ahab excelled uh, above all the others in, uh, in his wickedness. And you remember that last time we saw that it's dangerous to live next to the king. That's what we learned, uh, to have property right next door. Uh, and normally you're always wanting to, you know, have a great community and live next to successful people. But here we saw that Naboth had his family, uh, his family had their vineyard there. And, and you'll remember that, uh, that, that Ahab looked over and he wanted to put a vegetable garden there. And so he, he asked Naboth to uh, sell him the land and Naboth wouldn't. And you'll remember that, uh, that he then was very sad about that and he was pouting and Jezebel came to him and said, you know, why are you so downcast? And he said, because I can't plant my garden where I wanted it. And she's like, aren't you the king? Uh, and she says, you know, don't worry, I'll, I'll get the garden for you. And you remember she sent out later letters and hatched a plot that, uh, that he would be falsely accused after a fast at a feast. And, uh, and so we saw the death of Naboth, but we also saw then that uh, the Lord condemned uh, Ahab. Uh, and we saw that Micaiah warned uh, Ahab then uh, of the upcoming death. And, uh, and Ahab dies in battle. And, and we saw that Jehoshaphat was reigning in Judah. And we saw that uh, Ahaziah uh, came to power uh, in Israel and the, the northern ten tribes. And so we are going to see that God is going to judge Ahaziah as well. And then we also are going to see the, the passing of the mantle here of Elijah to Elisha. And so uh, let's jump in here to 2 Kings chapter 1 verse 1 and it says Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Now you remember that when David was the king over Israel he had subdued the nation of Moab and they became a, a, a tributary to the nation of Israel and so every year they would uh, bring their taxes and, and give those to the the nation of Israel and uh, but when Omri became the king, uh, Moab rebelled, and, uh, and we see that Moab was then brought into subjection once again underneath uh, Omri, and, uh, and so this remained through the reign of Ahab. But when Ahab passed away, then we see that Moab once again saw an opportunity, let's test uh, the new leadership, and so they uh, rebelled uh, here uh, from uh, from Israel. And so verse 2, it says, Now Ahaziah fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. And so he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. So he was up on the, uh, on the second floor there. He falls through the lattice in the upper room. And he sustains an injury, a serious injury. And so questioning whether or not the outcome, how he is going to fare, he desires to get a prophetic word. But rather than seeking after a prophet, <laughs> the true and the living God, we see that he goes to the Philistines. The, he goes to the city of, uh, of Ekron uh, and to the God of Ekron, uh, uh, and that is Beelzebub. That literal translation is the Lord of the Flies. And we see here that, uh, that his failure now uh, to inquire of Jehovah. Now, I just want you to just imagine that for a minute. You're, you are the king over Israel. And Israel's history is that he drew them out of Egypt and that he defeated uh, the Egyptian army and the, 
the incredible plagues that he brought down to force now uh, Egypt to, to release them. And yet we see with all of that, the apostasy was so great that when he himself, in, in a life-threatening situation, when he himself needed to know if he was going to be okay, rather than turning to the true and the living God, he turns now to a foreign God and is going to seek now to, to receive a word. Hopefully he is seeking that word of encouragement that is going to say that he is going to recover and that his life is going to be spared. And so this is obviously the answer that he is desiring. But the tremendous depth of the apostasy that had taken place. And not just no longer trusting in God, but putting your trust in a false God. And so it says, verse 3, But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And so Elijah departed. So the angel of the Lord, this is the pre-incarnate Christ. And so Christ here now comes and, and meets with Elijah. He appears to Elijah as well as he appeared to many of the other Old Testament leaders in the past. Abraham and Moses and Gideon, those are a few that uh, that had the appearance uh, of Christ. And his appearance uh, always are identified as important revelations. There's significant revelations when the angel of the Lord one shows, uh, shows up. And so uh, we see here that now Elijah is uh, sent in, in verse 5. And when the messengers returned to him, he said to them, why have you come back? Because they didn't get all the way to Ekron uh, and, and, and deliver the message and, and, and receive word. So suddenly it's a very short trip. It's a quick turnaround and, and the messengers are back. And so the king wants to know why, why have you returned so quickly? In verse 6, and it says, And so they said to him, A man came up to meet us and said to us, Go. Return to the king who sent you and say to him, thus says the Lord, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? And therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And so the messengers, I want you to imagine, that's not a message you want to give to the king, you know, that, that by the way, uh, <laughs> you're not going to live, you're not going to get out of that bed. Your life is going to be required of you. And so these messengers come with a very somber, sobering message now to Ahaziah. And Ahaziah, as he's laying there in bed, he listens to those words. And suddenly he is being told that his life is being cut short, that that's all the time that he gets. And so that news is impacting him as the messengers. He's trying to process everything that he's hearing. And so in verse 7, then he said to them, what kind of a man was it who came up to meet you and told you these words? You know, who, who was this? That just a, just a messenger came up out of nowhere and met you and told you those things to come and to tell me? And so, so he, he wants to know more information about this messenger in, in verse 8. And so they answered him, a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. And now uh, you remember that Ahab never wanted to hear anything that Elijah had to say because he always had bad news and bad prophecies uh, for him and judgment. And, uh, and so here we see that now Ahaziah, who's sitting on, a uh, on, a uh, on Ahab's uh, th throne, uh, he now uh, recognizes that it was Elijah also as well who gave this prophecy over him that gave this, this message to him. Now, this upset the king. So he's laying there in bed 
And he's just had, you know, Elijah tell him that the Lord has said that, that you are not going to recover. And so, you know, there's that old saying, you know, don't kill the messenger if you don't like the message that just got delivered to you. Well, here's a classic attempt of killing the messenger, you know. I mean, if you don't like that. And, and we're going to see here that Ahaziah is going to go after Elijah. And he now wants to kill Elijah because he didn't receive a favorable prophecy. So uh, here we see that, that he wasn't interested in truth. He just wanted uh, his own outcome the way that he wanted it. And how important it is that, that in our relationship with God, that we are seeking God's will in our life. That we are not seeking a predetermined outcome. That we are not trying to, to push God to, to move or to give us the outcome that, that we are seeking. Not our will, but thy will be done. And so here we see that Ahaziah is so upset that he wants to go and kill now, the prophet of God. And so he's going to send out some men. So how many men does it take to arrest a prophet? If you were going to send uh, out uh, now some soldiers to go and to arrest a prophet of God, do you think four would be enough? You know, four Roman guards or, you know, ten Ten would be a lot. Ten against one. You know, he's just a hairy prophet uh, uh, as well, you know. But 20 would definitely get the job done. We're, we're going to see here. Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So he sends 50 men. I want you to think how many men that is. I mean, if you form a circle around him, it's this gigantic circle, you know, with 50 guys and a captain of 50 that is sent as well. And so he went up to him, and there he was sitting on the top of a hill. And he spoke to him, man of God, the king has said, come down. And so Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And, uh, and so uh, here we see that... Mm, that he acknowledges, notice this, he acknowledges that Elijah was a man of God. But he ordered the prophet of God to come down in the king's name. And so what's happening here is who is under whose authority? Is the prophet of God underneath the king's authority? Or is the king underneath the prophet of God's authority? And so here we see that, uh, that he ordered him to come down in the king's name. And we see that he called down judgment from God upon the king. And so uh, we see here that, uh, that now, uh, in verse 11, that news gets back to Ahaziah. So now Ahaziah is given the word that fire came down from heaven, consumed 50 of his soldiers and the commander of the 50. So does he repent? No, look at what he does. It says, then he sent to him another 50 with his 50 men, another captain of 50 with his 50 men. And he answered and said to him, man of God, thus has the king said, come down quickly. So here again, the command, the king has commanded you to come down quickly. And so here we see that Elijah's repetition of the fact that, uh, that he was a man of God shows that this is an important to issue. Look at what he says, verse 12. So Elijah answered and said to him, if I am a man of God, because he had just declared man of God, he now says, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And so here we see that, you know, was 
Ahaziah in charge or is God in charge? And so this is the issue that is going on. And, uh, and we see by sending fire down from heaven, God was reminding Ahaziah that he is not the ruler over Israel, but God is the ruler over Israel. And God is not only the ruler over Israel, he is the ruler over all the earth. Amen? Uh, and so here we see that, that this now is being driven, that point is being driven home to Ahaziah as he is there uh, on his bed. Now, it's interesting, do you remember, you know, that Elijah now calls down fire on these, on these soldiers and it comes down. Do you remember when Jesus is coming through Samaria and they had uh, mistreated him in James and John, you know? They, they said, let's call down fire on them and just wipe them out, Lord, you know, probably referring right here to Elijah calling down fire uh, from heaven as well. So Ahaziah repented and prayed to the Lord. No, that's not. Look at verse 13. Look at what he does. He's lost a hundred foot soldiers and two captains uh, here as well. And now he is absolutely determined. And you know what it goes to show you is again, that when you're in your flesh and you start digging in, in your flesh, that, that all objectivity just goes right out the window and, and you start fighting against God and, and you have this predetermined outcome that you want. He wants to destroy Elijah. And now common sense is being cast out the window because common sense tells you that after the prophet of God call judgment on your first 50 that you change your tactics you know and you don't send 50 more men but after a hundred are lost you certainly don't send out the next 50 uh, as well when it is clearly this judgment from God but when we're in our flesh how difficult it is to see the spiritual things that are going on around us we are only able to see our own short-sightedness and uh, and so here we see that Ahaziah is going to send out this third captain, verse 13. Again, he sent a third captain of 50 uh, with his 50 men. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and pleaded with him. So we see uh, a difference now in this third captain. Whereas the first two captains tried to take authority over uh, Elijah and to put him underneath the king's authority and here we see that now there is a falling down on the knees that there is this respect for the man of God uh, and we see that he fell on his knees before Elijah and pleaded with him and said to him man of God please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight look Fire has come down from heaven and burned up the first two captains of fifties with their fifty. But let my life now be precious in your sight. Can you imagine this captain? Now, he knew the other captains and he knew the other soldiers that had just gone out, no doubt, uh, here as well. A and suddenly now, the king says, you're up next, go. And you're like, in your heart, you're like, didn't you see what just happened the last two times uh, here? But, you know, he's a soldier and he's given a command and now he has to go forwards. Uh, but in his heart, what does he do? He comes and he intercedes on behalf of his men and, and for his own life uh, as well. And now he pleads, but let my life now be precious in, in your sight. In verse 15, it says, And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him, and do not be afraid of him. And so he arose and went down with him to the king. Now, here again, we see that Elijah doesn't go with him because the man showed respect to him. It wasn't because the man bowed down to him. It wasn't because he pleaded with him. He went with the, this captain for one reason. The Lord told him to. And so that is the motivation. It wasn't a, a difference of tactic. It was a, a different directive now that had been given to him by the Lord. And so he went down with him to the king. 
And also, we see that the Lord emboldened Elijah to not be afraid of the king as well. Because if he was sending him in, he also was going to protect him as well. And so he told him, you don't need to be worried. You don't need to be concerned. And so the Lord now, verse 16, then he said to him, thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word? And so here we see that this is the word of the Lord. This is what came from the mouth of the angel of the Lord. And that is, is there no God in Israel? Have you forgotten who I am? And you think about God and how easy it is sometimes to just forget about God to start to slide away and to get busy with your own life. And, and how many people have just turned away from the Lord to pursue other things? We see in the parable that Jesus gave about the sower and the seed and how it goes on to the thorny ground and it, and it grows up, but the thorns grow up as well and choke out the life. We see the the, the seed that goes onto the rocky soil and, and it quickly comes up, but because it didn't have any root, it didn't stay and produce fruit. And how God's desire is for relationship with us. He wants relationship with you and with me. And so here we have the king over the nation that has forgotten about God, that has turned away from God. And so he reminds him here, is it because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word? And so he is confronting him now with the, uh, his backslidden condition. He says, therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And so the pronouncement of judgment now upon Ahaziah. In verse 17, so Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. And because he had no son, Jehoram became king in his place. In the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. So Jehoram becomes king over the ten tribes of Israel, the northern tribes. In Judah, there is also a Jehoram that is the king at the same time, but he is the son of Jehoshaphat. And so here we see that there are two Jehorams. Verse 17 can be uh, confusing there because he's giving the marker of uh, Jehoram in Israel according to it's in the second year of Jehoram in Judah, who is the son of Jehoshaphat. And in verse 18, it says, Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And so here we see that Ahaziah now suffers the judgment, and we see that, uh, that, that he also now ends up dying according to the word of the Lord. In chapter 2, we come to the end of Elijah's ministry. And Elijah has been this fiery prophet, has been this amazing prophet that, uh, that God used. We see that John the Baptist is a typology, is, you know, in the power of Elijah. And, you know, he is this man's man, lives in the wilderness. And, uh, and so here we see that Elijah now uh, has come to the end of his ministry. And we're going to see uh, how he is going to be taken up uh, by a whirlwind but one of the things that we are going to see is the passing on of his mantle of the anointing of elijah now elijah has a very faithful servant elisha who has been uh, with him and been being developed underneath elijah and it says in verse one here of this second chapter and it came to pass when the lord was about to take up elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now, Gilgal, you remember that Gilgal was the town where the Ark of the Covenant, when it had been captured by the Philistines, and then they sent it back, that it was one of the towns where, uh, where the Ark came, and Gilgal, and Gilgal, and they didn't want the Ark. Uh, and so it says, Then uh, Elijah said to Elisha, 
Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And so they went down to Bethel. And so uh, Elisha now is determined uh, here to be with his father in the faith until the very end. And Elisha refuses Elijah's suggestion now that he remain comfortably there in Gilgal. And oftentimes you would see that a dying person would pronounce the, the blessing now. Uh, on others and Elisha did not want to miss uh, his opportunity to receive God's blessing on his life and on his ministry and so wherever Elijah is going to go he is going to go as well now verse 3 it says now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today and he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. <laughs> and so here we see that they have had this revelation from the Lord that uh, Elijah is going to be taken up on that very day. And so they come to Elisha and they're like, are you aware of what the Lord is doing here? And that Elijah, this is going to be his last day. And, and Elisha is like, yes, don't say anything. Just be quiet. And, and, you know, yes, keep silent. Really, this means don't add to my sorrow by reminding me of it. And, you know, and that struck a chord. Don't, don't remind people of their sorrow. That there are times when just showing compassion and just being able to be there for people uh, is so important and here we see that uh, that he was upset. Elisha is upset by the fact that Elijah is going to be taken today. Uh, but it only is adding to his sorrow to enter into a conversation about it. In verse 4, it says, Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And so they came to Jericho. And, uh, and you think of just the, the heaviness of the day. And, and, and as Elisha is just continuing to follow, uh, wherever Elijah goes, he is going faithfully uh, with him. And so they came to Jericho. Jericho, this beautiful oasis uh, there that sits right uh, not far from the Jordan River and the Transjordan Valley. And uh, and so they came to Jericho now in verse 5. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And so he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Why is everybody coming up and telling me this uh, here today? And, and so there is great sorrow in the hearts of the people. Elijah has been, has been a tremendous prophet of God. And for those remnant, for those people whose heart was for God, Elijah was a, a great and a mighty man that stood for truth and stood for righteousness. And, uh, and so uh, here we see that, that these prophets, the school of prophets, were, uh, were now prophesying and, and, and God was speaking to them about the departure of Elijah. It is always tragic when you lose a mighty man of God, when we lose the mighty men of God. And, and so Elijah was one of those mighty men of God. In verse 6, then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And so the two of them went on. And Elijah, again, refused to put his own comfort, to, uh, or Elisha refused to put the prospect of his own comfort ahead of receiving a special blessing from God. And, and here we see that his desire was God's blessing on his life. That's, that's what he wanted. And he was willing to be inconvenienced, and he was willing to follow Elijah wherever Elijah went. Because God's blessing on his life, that was, that's what was important to Elisha. 
And what's important to you? What's important to you in your life? For Elisha, it was God's blessing on his life. Is God's blessing on your life, is that important for us uh, as it was uh, for Elisha? And here we see that he's having to walk from city to city, from town to town, but he is not going to be put off because his desire is for that blessing from God. I will not leave you. And so the two of them went on. In verse 7, and 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance. And while the two of them stood by the Jordan, now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. And it was divided this way and that so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Now, the 50 other prophets, uh, they are sitting there, the sons of the prophets, they're watching from a distance and, and they get up to the river. And so the river is uh, impossible to, 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 to cross. And, and so suddenly they're all watching because they're just walking straight to the river and you're expecting them to go left or right. But that's not the way that they end up going. They just end up going straight. And they're like, holy cow, look at what has just happened. Elijah touches the water and the river parts and the old prophet just walks right across the river on dry land. And, 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 and of course, this is the echo of the nation of Israel being delivered out of Egypt. And, uh, and so when the Red Sea parted and the Israelites walked through it on dry land uh, while the Red Sea is there on both sides. And so here is Elisha and Elijah now, and they cross over to the other side, and so uh, on dry land. A prophet's cloak symbolized uh, his authority under God, and with which God clothed and empowered him. And so that cloak was representative of, of the power of God that was upon his life. Now, Elijah in his own power was just a man. Had no more power than you or I have. It was just the power of God now that rested uh, upon Elijah to fulfill God's directives. And so uh, here we see that mantle is the representation, the physical representation of the power of God that was upon Elijah. Now, it is interesting as we see Elijah parting water, as we see him calling down fire from heaven, as we see him stopping up the heavens so that it wouldn't rain, uh, as we see him call down fire from heaven to burn the sacrifice there up on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal, when we see all of these mighty works and and then you remember Jesus' words. When Jesus said of every man that's ever been born, John the Baptist was the greatest of all of them. But then Jesus went on to say, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater even than John the Baptist. You see, these men had the power of God that would come upon them. The Holy Spirit would come upon them and work through them, would fill them, and then use them. But they did not have the Spirit of God inside of them. They didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. That is the difference. The, the power of God would fall upon them for a specified action, and they would go forth and act on God's behalf, but, uh, but then the Spirit of God would depart. And, uh, and so we see here that we have the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of us, and we are a new creation in Christ. And, and, and so again, when Jesus you know, talks about, you know, Elijah and John the Baptist and the great and the mighty prophets and yet tells us about the Holy Spirit and the comforter and this church age that we are in, that the kingdom of God is now at hand, that we can enter into this new relationship with God that exceed, eclipses all of the, uh, of the mighty men of God that we have seen and that we have studied in the Old Testament and 
So they crossed over on dry land. The prophets and the sea, the water parted. And, uh, and again, what an encouragement that had to have been what, to, to know that God was with Elijah and Elijah's, you know, the great prophet and, and is helping in the leading of the nation, governing and, and assisting in turning it back towards the Lord. Verse 9, and so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, ask what may i do for you before i am taken away from you and elisha said please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me and so he said you have asked a hard thing nevertheless if you see me when i am taken from you it shall be so for you but if not it shall not be so and so what elisha requested was the blessing of the firstborn the firstborn would receive a double portion of the inheritance. And, and so here we see that, uh, that now Elisha wanted a spiritual double portion, not a material double portion. Uh, double portion. And so he wasn't asking to be uh, twice as popular or to, be, uh, you know, t- to do twice as many miracles we see that what Elisha was asking was to be the successor to Elijah and to be used by God to carry on his ministry underneath God to the nation. And so verse 11, we see it says, Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, when Elisha asks for that double portion of blessing, we see that Elijah says, that's a big request, (laughs) you know, and obviously he is not able to say yea or nay to it. But the Lord gives him the the very uh, proof of whether or not the Lord is going to honor that prayer or not in the evidence that when he is taken up, that if Elisha sees Elijah taken up, if it happens right before him, then God will have answered that, that in the affirmative. And if he doesn't see him when he is caught up to be with the Lord, then there isn't going to be the fulfillment of that prayer. And so we see here that, uh, that suddenly now, this chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah goes up by a whirlwind into heaven. What, what an amazing picture that is. But here we see that this is now a picture of the rapture of the church. We see that there are two people that have been raptured up into the church or into heaven that have never experienced death. And one of them here is Elijah, and the other is is Enoch. And both of them, we see now, uh, were caught up into heaven. So there is this picture of the rapture now of them being caught up. Now, it's also interesting that there is in the book of Revelation talk about the two prophets that are going to uh, be there in Jerusalem and giving testimony and that these two prophets are going to die and they're going to be watched by the entire world. The whole world is going to watch them as they're going to give gifts and make merriment while their bodies lie dead in the street. And prior to the advent of television, There was a question of how could everybody in the whole world, I remember saying, how could everybody in the whole world be watching a single event that's taking place in in Jerusalem? And now with the CNN (laughs) network and the news networks and the internet and all of that, I mean, they have these web cameras that they keep, you know, you can watch little eagle eggs, uh, you know, they put web cameras in little animals' nests and all different things. You can check in on them and, and watch in live time what's you know what's going on on these nature cameras that uh, that are going on all over the place and uh, and, and so there's going to be a camera that's going to be set up on these uh, uh, on these prophets of God's dead bodies but then they are going to be resurrected 
and they are then going to uh, ascend into heaven. And so he, here we see Elijah now. He is just caught up. He is just raptured up. Now, given the choice between rapture and death, I'm choosing rapture, you know. I mean, that's the option that I'm going to vote for, you know, is the rapture. And so uh, he is taken up into heaven in the sight of Elisha. And the mantle now, the ministry, falls upon mm, Elisha. Now, you remember that there were the 11 apostles. And they also watched Jesus ascend into heaven and now the ministry fell upon them to carry out the ministry and to continue to to move uh, forwards as well and so verse 12 it says and elisha saw it and he cried out my father my father the chariot of israel and its horsemen and so he saw him no more and he took hold of his own clothes and, and tore them in two pieces and so a, a sign of grief over the, the loss, the sorrow over the loss of Elijah. And he also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Now, this would be interesting, wouldn't it? Elijah had parted the water. That's how they got on the other side. <laughs> now it's time to go back and Elijah's gone, but he's got his mantle. And so look at what he decides to do. Uh, it says, and then he took the mantle, verse 14, of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? In other words, God, are you with me? Have you blessed me now? And are you with me? And so mm, cries out now, where is the Lord God of Elisha? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Now the prophets, I wonder if they were still there and they saw Elisha now part the waters uh, and he comes back, uh, uh, but he is, he is dry. Now it says, verse 15, now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They were able to discern the blessing now that was upon Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And then they said to him, Look now, there are 50 strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master, lest perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, you shall not send to anyone. Now, it's interesting. They're like, what happened to Elisha? You know, where's his body? We, we want to go bury him. Or, you know, what happens if he fell out of that chariot as it was, you know, going up to that seatbelts in it uh, or not here? And, uh, and so they, they want to go and, and they want to search all over for Elijah's body. Now, Elisha saw Elijah ascend into heaven. So he knows there is no body that you're going to find that's out there. If you're going to go look, check heaven. <laughs> okay, start, start there and then work your way into the wilderness uh, from there. So he says, you shall not send anyone. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send them. So therefore they sent 50 men and they searched for three days, but did not find him. So I wonder if, you know, they're, they're encouraging, but let us go search. And, and Elisha is telling them that you don't need to search. You don't need to search to the point where it may have almost felt like he had something to hide now. Like, wh why won't you let us go search? And to the point where he's like, you know what? You want to go search? Go search. <laughs> you know, I'm not hiding anything. You're not gonna find anything out there. There was, you know, nothing happened out there other than, you know, than what I shared. And now it's interesting because again, they did know that the spirit of Elijah was upon Elisha. So it started with that discernment. Uh, uh, but now he he sends them 
uh, after the, there has been, you know, a little bit of interaction, verse 18. And when they came back to him, for he had stayed in Jericho, he said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? <laughs> so I love this because the, here's Elisha with an I told you so. <laughs> and so verse 19. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, please notice the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground and barren. And so uh, trouble with the water that is there. And so they bring this issue to Elisha. And I love it because they are trusting in God now. They're bringing this problem that they've got to the Lord. And what is the problem? Drinking water. We have, we have bad drinking water. But do you know what? God cares about even your drinking water. God cares about you and he cares about the details of your life and what is going on in your life. And there's a situation, there's a barrenness, there's a challenge, there's a problem, there's a trial, it's a hardship. And so, you know, you wouldn't think that, that the water would be an issue that they would bring to the prophet, but they do. And, and so, verse 20, and he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. And so they brought it to him. And then he went out to the source of the water, to the spring. And he cast in the salt there and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. And so the water remains healed to this day according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. And so it begins, Elisha's ministry begins with the parting of the water that lets him walk back over to them on dry land. And then to this mighty miracle in front of them, demonstrating that God uh, is with them. In verse 23, And then he went up from there to Bethel. And as he was going up the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. So... Apparently, there was a little bit of hair loss that uh, he was dealing with in his life. And, uh, and so, verse 24, look at this. So, he turned around and looked at them. There's 50 youth there. And he pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. <laughs> And so uh, here we see you don't mess with the prophet of God uh, in verse 25. And then he went from there to Mount Carmel. And from there he returned to Samaria. And so we see Elisha carrying on the mantle now uh, of Elijah. And God is always going to have a remnant. God is always going to raise up his faithful remnant. And, uh, and so I just want to encourage us to continue to just seek after the Lord. Just continue to walk after him and pursue the Lord. Let's pray. Father, you are so good. We thank you and we love you. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love and your concern that you have for each and every one of us. You bind up the brokenhearted. You strengthen the weak. You heal the sick. Lord, you succor the bruised. And Father, we just bring all of our bangs, all of our bruises, all of our dings, all of the bitter water that's in our lives, and we ask you to, to heal them. Lord, whatever areas of our heart that there's barrenness in, Lord, we pray that... Uh, that you would remove that barrenness and, and replace it with fertile ground, Lord. We pray, God, that you would just move mightily in our hearts and in our lives. Bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've never accepted the Lord, don't leave here without doing that. And also, if you need prayer, I want to invite you to come forward for prayer as well.
Next time we're going to continue here in our Second Kings study, and uh, and this weekend we are going to finish up Mark's Gospel chapter thirteen, and so we're going to be looking at the second coming uh, of our Lord. We just watched uh, Elijah depart to heaven. We're going to see the Lord return from heaven, and so that's going to be this weekend. May. You have an extraordinary Thanksgiving. Uh, and so may God's blessing just be upon you and upon your families. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's stand to close. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King. Bless you. Happy Thanksgiving.